All right, everyone, welcome. My name is Karen Lauritsen, and this is the Open Textbook Networks Pub 101. I am happy to be joined by all of you, as well as two new members of the OTN team, Barb Thies, who is our new community manager, and Craig Sandler, who's our new communication specialist. They are in their first and second week of uh, being on the team. And uh, now we're embarking together on this uh, orientation to open textbook publishing. Just a friendly reminder, this is not a class, no one's gonna be grading you, and we don't even have to say goodbye when it is over. If you would like to stay connected to a community of people who are asking questions about publishing or want to develop publishing programs on their campuses, you will be uh, welcome to join Pub 101 if you're at an eligible institution. Excuse me, you'll be welcome to join the publishing co-op following Pub 101 um, if you're at an eligible institution, and I'm always happy to tell you more about that. I'm gonna start with some housekeeping and general sort of uh, orientation and introduction stuff for about the first 20 minutes. Um, it looks like some of you have already gotten started in the chat, which is awesome. If you'd like to say hello to one another that way, you will have other opportunities in this hour to say hello to each other. Um, and then after this uh, sort of housekeeping first 20 minutes, I'm going to turn things over to Elle Demopoulos. She is our guest today and the Access Technologist and ZTC OER Specialist at the College of Marin. Both Elle and I are in California. So I think you probably all by now have accessed the um, Zoom orientation document. Just in case, I'm going to put a link in the chat. This is what some people might call a syllabus, but I'm hesitant to call a syllabus since this is not a course. This is really just your one-stop shop for figuring out what are we doing, when are we doing it, what did I miss, um, and where are those great slides that Elle shared with us, you know, where can I find that? Everything is going to be linked out from this orientation plan document. I encourage all of you um, to follow along and participate. You really will make Pub 101 um, whatever it's going to be. Um, I'm not the expert here. I'm really the facilitator. I'm the connector. I am um, bringing you all together. Now, we are obviously all together in Zoom, and this is a much larger part of your lives than it was the last time uh, we held Pub 101. So I understand there may be some Zoom fatigue. Um, and I wish we had other options, but we'll, we'll try to keep things um, interactive and engaging for you. We did have uh, an OTN webinar that was Zoom bombed a couple weeks ago. Perhaps some of you were there. It was really rough. Um, so I have made some changes to our Zoom uh, security, but I think we should be okay as long as we're not sharing this link in social media anywhere. So um, please don't do that. If somehow we are found and people want to disrupt our meeting, I will just pull the plug um, and uh, regroup and send you guys an update after that. I, I won't try to um, wrangle things. When we did get Zoom bombed, it's, it felt like there were 100 people suddenly in the meeting with us. It wasn't just like one person disrupting. So that's why I'll just go ahead and, and pull the plug. Um, it's always great to see people and hear people, so um, I encourage you to um, uh, turn on the microphone when you have questions, and if our bandwidth is such that um, having cameras on is okay, um, please feel free to have your cameras on, you know, totally up to you. Um, depending on how things go, we've got 48 people um, right now in Pub 101. Depending on how vigorous the conversation may be, we'll, I'll um, figure out what kind of um, mediation needs to happen in the chat. For now, I ask that um, you know, when Elle, for example, is finished with her um, presentation, to think of sort of the big picture questions first about accessibility, for example, and then if you have really nitty gritty questions about a particular technology or you know, just the right coding. Um, that those are great questions um, to save either for later after we've covered some bigger questions or in our class notes, which I'll introduce shortly. Um, I will say that there are many, many ways to publish, many, many ways to publish um, open textbooks and other OER and as well as build a program. And so 
as with anything, you're going to get a lot of information during Club 101, and some of it may not sink in until you're doing it, which is one reason why I mentioned the publishing co-op. That's to stay connected with people as these things may come to, to be realized at your particular institution. For example, we'll talk about MOUs, but when you're actually working on your MOU, you might want to reach out to people and ask specific questions. And the, the co-op is just the kind of community where you can do that. Are there any questions about any of that information I've just uh, blown through here in the first five minutes? All right, thanks, Alex. I appreciate the feedback. So we have a Zoom poll, what I'm calling an existential poll. Who are you and why are you here? Uh, so if you can please respond, uh, this is anonymous, so no one will know your um, uh, feelings existentially at this time. But number one, you guys can see this, right? Can you nod for me if you can see the poll? OK. Uh, which best describes your current role? Uh, you might be doing OER all the time. Maybe you're doing some OER, lots of other things. Hey, I'm not doing any OER, but I dare to dream. Uh, second question, what best describes your publishing experience? I'm a total pro. I could, I could run the show. I know some things, or I'm totally new at this. I've got nothing. And why have you joined Pub 101? You uh, can select all that apply here. Um, all the things, just want to learn. I know faculty who want publishing support, and I'm trying to figure out what that is. And we are definitely starting a publishing program. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. I think the numbers have stopped. It's been up for about an hour, an hour, a minute. <laughs> As we said earlier, this, this is strange uh, when it comes to time and space. So here you can see the results, right? Please nod for me. Are you able to see the results? Thank you, Claire. I can see uh, you're right at the top of my screen, so I appreciate that. Um, it looks like most of you have responsibilities that encompass OER, but you're also responsible for a lot of other stuff. Um, some of you know some things about publishing, which is fabulous. I encourage you, please chime in. Please add what you know to this course. This is really about um, collective knowledge, so um, chime in at any time. And um, I'm happy to see that many of you uh, love learning and um, that many of you also know faculty who are looking for publishing support. So we've got a little bit of um, a sense of who we are collectively. Now I would like for you to meet uh, a few people, sort of a sample size of Pub 101. As I mentioned earlier, I am the facilitator and the expertise, support, and community comes from all of you. And so over the course of Pub 101, you'll be hearing from OTN members, as well as publishing cooperative partners who are here really to support you and your publishing endeavors by sharing their experience. So I didn't want to you know, try to get us through 48 different uh, introductions in one Zoom call. Um, so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in small breakout groups. I imagine it will go something like this. Uh, my name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm publishing director at the University of Minnesota and at the Open Textbook Network. And um, I'm in Pub 101 to support all of you in learning more about publishing and perhaps supporting your faculty in publishing OER. Um, feel free to share other information about yourself. I'm wearing this hat because I got really carried away with um, embarking on adventures and I'm the captain of the ship type metaphors previously. Um, I've seen some of you have cats at home with you. Um, share any other information you would like. I'll give you about five minutes in those random groups. Um, if you have any questions, <clears throat> feel free to unmute or put something in the chat while I get your groups together. This is the part where the breakout groups went away from where I was used to them being. I'm sorry. Has anyone hosted a Zoom meeting recently where they're, oh, found them. Okay, phew. Just needed to make a bigger window there. Alrighty. There's going to be five of you per room, so that's about a minute per person. And when I um, start to regroup you, you'll get a one minute warning. So if you haven't heard from anyone by then, please uh, be sure to include everybody. And break. Alrighty, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed uh, getting to know each other for a brief few minutes. 
Um, now I would like to turn your attention to class notes, um, which I see many of you have already visited, which is awesome. I've also seen some of you doing homework ahead, which is great as well. Um, I take that as a sign of your interest and enthusiasm, which is always exciting um, when facilitating uh, something like this. So I'm not going to talk through the first couple pages here, uh, mainly because I already said it in the first couple minutes of this meeting. Um, it's just a little bit about um, Zoom and about what to expect with our chats. And really the idea with class notes is if you guys want to continue the conversation outside of this one hour that we have together, here's a place where you can do that. If we have a really popular um, talk and we can't say everything we want to say, um, you know, you can continue to engage with a, a presenter in this space or extend the conversation. Um, and I've made a place for you below to do that. It might get messy. You might decide you want to have a conversation through comments instead. Um, this is really your space. You all have editing privileges. Um, so feel free to make your collective class questions and notes, whatever you want to make it. Um, <clears throat> I will pull your attention to page three, um, where you'll see a green table under meeting one, April 15th. A lot of you have already entered your information. So this is a, a little bit more collective. You just got to know about uh, five other people in a small group, and this is everybody at a glance. So um, before our meeting next week, if you will please add your name here, um, that way you all can see who's here with you. Um, and, uh, um, and that's always a plus. And then right below the table is where you'll see an area for questions and comments. Are there any questions about class notes or introductions? Okay. Now I'm going to briefly highlight what was covered in unit one of our open textbook publishing curriculum. And when I say briefly, I mean briefly, because I'm sure that most all of you are already really familiar um, with this information. I just kind of want to lay it out there as our foundation so that we're all in um, clear about our starting point. So um, in Pub 101, we're going to focus on textbooks. Uh, but of course, our conversations can really be extended to publishing other OER. Um, but textbooks are unique as well in that they're not monographs. Um, as I don't know how long it's been since many of you have looked at a textbook, but if you can recall, there are a lot of different um, pedagogical devices, um, a lot of uh, graphic breakdown of information, there might be a sidebar, there might be um, case studies, there might be, uh, um, you know, key terms at the beginning of a chapter. And so when we talk about textbooks, um, at the OTN, we're talking about those types of publications, something that's very structured um, and that is consistent from chapter to chapter so that a rhythm uh, is created for the reader, for the student. The student learns to anticipate, oh, when I get to the next chapter, there's going to be a summary um, of you know, what I can expect to learn in this coming chapter and so on. Um, <clears throat> Also, when we're talking about open textbooks, we are, of course, talking about those that are free and that have permissions to edit and change them. And the reason why accessibility and inclusion are in unit one is really because um, these things should be thought about throughout the development of a project and really seen as integral to the creation of any kind of um, OER. And that's so that it doesn't become a checklist of things to do at the end of a project or sort of this onerous um, task, but really more of a, a thinking exercise, which is what Elle is going to talk more about. Who are the students who are going to be using um, this, this learning material? How can I you know, be as inclusive as possible so that the, the reader can identify with what is here um, and extend that information to their own lives? Um, it's also thinking about accessibility and inclusion from the beginning does help with your workload in the long run. Um, a lot of what we talk about throughout Pub 101 is, is kind of front loading the lift or front loading a lot of the labor. Um, and it, it, it can really feel like a drag to be honest in the beginning. It's like, oh, there's so many things to do. But 
I promise it's so much better than trying to do them retroactively or trying to do them on a deadline or right after a faculty author has finished their part and they think that it's almost there and you know, can we publish this next week? Um, so, so we're really you know, looking out for you and your experience in um, wanting and encouraging you to think about this earlier on. I think um, I'm going to turn things over to Elle. She's going to introduce accessibility and inclusivity and leave time for your um, discussion and questions. I mentioned also uh, there's a homework assignment uh, that some of you have started on, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but without further ado, um, Elle Dem Demopoulos, Access Technologist, ZTC OER Specialist at College of Marin. Thanks, Elle. Wait, you're muted. Yeah, yeah myself <laughs> right you know even the technologist has a problem with zoom sometimes right we're, we're all there so uh, like I said thanks Karen and I want to just reiterate what you said at the beginning accessibility should really be thought about in a design thinking you know, process right where we're we're thinking about equity as it stems throughout the process you know, in both authorship and readership, right? So without further ado, hopefully you can see my screen there. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, so I wanted to start off with this common question that I often get. May, let's make it accessible. Right, and for those of you who are mathematically inclined, you'll notice that in my title, that's the symbol for paradox. So accessibility exists on a continuum. And there's no such thing really as make it accessible, make it 100% accessible, because what's accessible to one population might be a different way of uh, interpreting or producing or really mediating that information depending on you know what modality they prefer right so if you have somebody that comes to you with the goal like we're going to make it 100 percent accessible well what they're really saying is we have some guidelines whether that be wcag or any other type of standard that, that, that we're gonna adhere to a, a baseline, right? So thinking about that, and let's reshift our focus from this 100% accessibility model to, um, which really lines up with like this to-do checklist that some, some folks have, right? And really reframe it in a, let's think about it as a, uh, a design process that we have to keep checking in with ourselves, right? Not only through, again, the authorship and the creation phase, but also the design phase, the publishing phase, the review phase, right? All of those phases that I think Karen will, will touch on <laughs> in, throughout Pub 101, but for now, we're going to uh, move on to the next slide, design language, right? So context is key to both accessibility and knowledge making. I think most of us are familiar, whether we be faculty teaching in a subject discipline or we're information professionals, we know that you know, trying to establish and build that meaning-making pyramid, right, where we have data at the bottom, information, and then using both of those plus context is where we really start to make and create that knowledge, right? So accessibility is really about context. And we'll, we'll see what we mean when we, we get a little, little further on here. And for those of you who, who speak Greek like I do, that's a little fun um, call out to those uh, who are like, you know, accessibility is all Greek to me. Well, here, we're gonna give you some, some uh, language lessons. So, Really, again, we're thinking in designing, in writing, in reading. Think about all of those processes and modalities when you're thinking about creating an OER text, right? 
what kind of tool are you using? Is that tool accessible? Does it have built-in accessibility features? I know in our breakout room, we were talking about platforms, right? So if you're gonna create or start an OER project, think about that when you are evaluating your platform choice, right? Are most of your authors going to be creating it in Word and then converting it to a platform? Or are they going to write directly in a platform such as Pressbooks or any of the other ones that are, that are out there? And then how does this really shape your final product, right? So how does the subject or the audience really determine the format and the layout of your textbook? So for instance, if your audience is a general readership, how would you want to create an accessible piece of media or a textbook that's really going to speak to that? If you're teaching uh, math, chemistry, or physics, for example, depending on your level and your discipline, right? You're going to create your textbook a little bit differently with all of those formulas and especially keeping accessibility in mind. And we'll open those big can of worms with STEM accessibility at the end. So I, I know people are very excited about trying to make LaTeX accessible. So I've already fielded some questions. So um, we, can, we can get into that at the end of the presentation. Obviously, if like Karen said about you, the design of the textbook, do you have a call out? Are you using formulas? Is it a live textbook? Are you using interactables? If you're an art history, OER? Is it using glossy images? You know, are you using charts and tables? All of these things really determine the structure of your textbook and then how to make it designed with accessibility and equity in mind. Also keep in mind the format. Are you going to build it in a content management or a IR or a platform? What's the export features look like? Are you going to export to PDF, EPUB? Is there an option for an audiobook? Are you going to be primarily using it for um, online, right? So if you're just uh, using an OER textbook that integrates right into an LMS like Canvas, for instance, and it's all HTML5, great. But think about that, you know, depending on how you're creating that media and how people are. Um, both designing, writing, and reading it. So getting a little bit into the formatting, obviously we want to think about using headings, right? So think about headings as desired paths. I know for some folks that's a, um, an already well-known concept, for, but for those of us who need a little bit of a refresher, desire paths are those paths that people or animals or anything happens to make when you're, you're walking along in urban spaces, right? So this really guides the reader down that structure, right? So when we're thinking about textbooks, we really need to have a, a map of where you want the reader to go, and headings is a great way to do that. Emphasize with bold and in-text callouts, don't try not to use italics. Try not to use um, the uh, colors that really are the only way of displaying and distributing information, right? So thinking about color contrast, and what I like to give an example of is stop signs, for instance, right? If maybe you're colorblind, um, you know, stop, we all know that maybe stop signs are red, right? But if you don't know that stop sign is red, you can still interpret that information effectively because it's shaped in a particular way and it's created and designed in a certain uh, standard way so that even if you don't have access or you're not inputting one type of that mode or modality of information, you can get the context of what it's trying to do in that, um, in that space. So when you're producing those textbooks or creating those textbooks, think about whatever 
content you're putting in, whether it be an image or text, try not to have another way of interpreting that information. So multimodal, basically. And here's a question I often get, um, especially when it comes to textbooks and like the difference between something that's going to be produced and as like a, an EPUB or PDF, a actual print textbook or something that's gonna be embedded into an LNS, um, just straight HTML, is there's a difference between obviously the print links and the live links, right? So we all know to do the you know, highlighted links that are what I call the, the not naked links, right? So we, we don't have the whole address at the bottom. We instead highlight it, make it meaningful and attach to the link. Um, to the actual text. Now, obviously, if you're thinking about creating a textbook, you know, you wanna make sure that that live link is gonna be meaningful. What I like to do is, if it's going to be used online somewhere, keep it to this example, but also provide a reference at the back of the chapter. So you can actually spell out the link that it's stable and static in let's say the end notes or you know whatever kind of um, reference style you use whether it be MLA, APA, etc. So here's where we get to the the, the meat of the uh, the presentation here. Now when we're thinking about captions in all text sometimes I get this puzzled look on folks' faces where, what's the difference? When do I use what? What goes in that alt text space anyway, right? Now, again, what we really wanna think about is, what is it doing? What's the context of whatever image or whatever graph or whatever table, whatever formula you're using? Think about its use. Is it decorative? Is it functional? Is it informative, right? We can kind of call back our controlled vocabulary, if we, if some of us went to information school, you know, thinking about that, right? So what is it actually doing? What kind of vocabulary are we using and how is it being used, right? A picture of a cat might just be a picture of my cat, right? But if it's a veterinary textbook, it's obviously serving another purpose, right? Or if it's a biology textbook, it's serving a different purpose. Or if it's an art history textbook, it's serving yet another purpose. So thinking about the context in what we're really displaying in that image and what's it doing in text, that's really the key to writing an effective alt text. Additionally, I always like to make sure, again, thinking about that, that uh, different and multimodal way to really think about information and how we're, we're, we're producing it and creating it, is that information in the text? Maybe you call it out in actually in text, and that way you can copy that information directly to the alt text. That way the folks who are not using alt text can get it, and the folks that need the alt text can also you know, take use and, and benefit from it. The two differences I like to describe is alt text provides replacement context for the image, right? So if you didn't have access to the image at all, how is this going to be interpreted by the reader, right? Captions are also great. Now, if you want to do both, that's, again, building on that framework of accessibility. Captions provide additional context. So, for instance, maybe you have a in-text callout, right? Here's, if you see the image to the left, it's about a cat. Then the alt text might describe what that, that picture of the cat is doing, right? What function it's playing in the text. And then maybe a caption underneath it, you know, my cat or the Latin name for cat, if you're so inclined, if you're in that discipline. So thinking about that, right? What the image or whatever media you're displaying is doing, really the context is the most important here. And of course, you are 
and your authors are your own subject experts. So really it, it's, it's up to you and your team to determine how that, that picture or that image or that element is being used. So trends to consider. This is a new slide I wanted to put up uh, since the last go round. Um, and it kind of plays into the current situation that we're in. Think about designing for equity in bandwidth, right? Um, and I mean that both from a tech perspective and a socioeconomic perspective. If you produce a very high quality textbook, that's great. Well, you know, that, we love to see that. But think about how you can chop those chapters up, right? Think about if uh, a reader is reading that on their phone or their tablet device, which is only going to get, you know, uh, stronger and it's going to grow. Um, I think this is a, a prime example. I've, I know I fielded a question from multiple folks from the student side and the faculty side about, well, I, I see it if I have a laptop, but I can't read it on my phone, right? So think about maybe uh, how your material is scalable, right? Is it, is those, are those images scalable? Do you have a low res version of it? Is there a mobile um, format that might be um, better for use for mobile? A uh, good example of this is PDFs. PDFs are great because they're very specific as to what their layout um, how, and, and how it's displayed, right? But if you've ever tried to use a PDF on a mobile device, I see Karen smiling. <laughs> you know, though it's not very scalable. It's, it's, it's extremely hard to read because you have to pinch and zoom all over the place, right? So, you know, think about if you're gonna have a PDF, great. Again, that speaks to the multimodal, you know, thinking about how we're gonna design for accessibility and equity. Maybe have your EPUB, which is scalable, right? And you can use the technology within the new EPUB standard to have multiple images, ones that may be low res, chapters that are chopped up, right? So that might be a better way to go about it. And additionally, think about folks who are using accessibility tools like VoiceOver on their mobile, right? The new iPhones and Androids are getting very good at, you know, text to speech. You just have to produce it and create it in a content that's going to be readable in that particular format. So I want to give you a little bit of a taste about um, how some of the tools that exist out there work. One of the really cool things that I've found is the um, Totally demo or Tot Ally demo, depending on how you want to say it. So I'm going to open my screen here. If you just want to do a Google search for um, Totally, um, that's it's the first search result, so you can follow along. Um, that might work as well. Can you all see my screen? All right, so as we can tell, we have the nice little uh, rainbow here. If we scroll down, here's a couple of descriptions about how it totally works. It's actually a little bit of a JavaScript file that you can actually use as a bookmarklet for how screen readers and folks who use accessibility options, you know, see your content, right? And this will work with any kind of um, extensible content. So we're scrolling down a little bit. So if you go down to the little sunglasses icon here, it'll tell you, hey, here's all your headers, right? It'll tell you, hey, this header is an invalid level. So as you'll notice, if you go into the summary, here's how the breakdown of headers works, right? So don't, here's a quick tip, don't use the title header. Use header one as your topic or the beginning of your chapter. And then you can use multiple header twos. I know a lot of people 
sometimes get tripped up with how to do headers. But yes, you can use multiple header twos and header threes. They're basically just like bullets, right? But make sure there's only one header one and you don't jump around, let's say, from header two to header four. Um, also, if you look at the contrast, you can tell right here it's telling you this text is too light. So the contrast ratio is usually between uh, 3.13 and 3.9. I know that's a, a bit technical, but basically the, the content material between the background and the text or whatever the image is, that's where you want to be familiar with, with contrast. And it also uh, checks for the uh, color blindness for folks who have that issue. So you can also check the link text. So here's the link text. It just says, hey, click here. I think we're, we've all done that before, right? So making that informative link of making it meaningful about something, and it will tell you some directions right here. Um, also, if you go down to image, here's, it'll tell you what the image text is. Here's where the alt, if this has no alt tag and this is interpreted as decorative. One of the other cool features that I think is a killer app for this particular tool is the screen reader wand. If you don't want to go through the hassle of it maybe installing NVDA Reader or Kurzweil or Read and Write or Chrome Fox or JAWS or any of the other tools that are out there, you know, feel free to shoot me an email or put it in the class notes if you want to know more about those tools and how to install it and how to use that as a, a test bed with whatever content platform system that you're using. If you click the screen reader wand, it'll show what the screen reader will read out in the text box. So that's a, a, an interesting way for you to really think about how the content looks from a design point of view and from an accessibility and equity point of view. This is also gives you a little insight into what mobile users will see because there's a lot of tools on mobile that strips out all of the decorative content and just makes it pure text. I know you've seen some of the apps probably um, like Newsreader and Binreader and um, things along those lines that actually condense a lot of that. So going back here to our PowerPoint. Don't be an accessibility cannibal, right? Here's a few words about accessibility and uh, grammar checkers. Accessibility checkers are great, but they're the first step, right? They really need whoever is the author or whatever team is working on whatever content it is to really think about the context of what kind of accessibility tool, and especially when we're thinking about alt tags and alt text, what kind of uh, format and modality we're using, right? So uh, I know a lot of us are familiar with the, hey, let's, let's eat folks and let's eat folks. So really think about that, that context when you're building that content. And just to wrap things up, you know, really recognize, especially if you're working by yourself, or maybe in a small team, technology fatigue, right? There's a lot of tools out there. Uh, be mindful of what kind of tools you're using, how they're designed, how they impact your final product, and all of those issues. And, you know, treat yourself with a little bit of care and respect, right? I know with, uh, you know, Zoom, they are updating it every seems like three days now. And while we're thankful for a lot of their security updates, thank you, Zoom, you know, it, they do move things around. Just like, you know, anything that's developed in an agile environment, you know, Canvas updates every 12 weeks, there's gonna be a lot of tools that are either not updated for like two years or updated every month, it seems. So give yourself a second to really think about those tools. And if something is not working quite as intended, reach out, which goes to my next 
point, find informed communities of practice here, either at OTN, at your local campus, or beyond. Reach out to any of us via email or through the class notes, and we'd be happy to communicate with you. Edit with experts. Find your content expert, your discipline expert, your accessibility expert, and you know, make sure that they're part of that team before you start that project. So you get an idea of you know, what to look for as you move forward and practice self-care. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Karen and we can take a look at the, the Google Doc all text activity. And here's my context um, and contact information. On the next slide, feel free to post your questions in the doc. If we don't get them to them by today, we'll respond by next clash session. And just one takeaway here, universal design elements like captions and tags are necessary for some, but they are good for everyone. So thinking about that when we're creating our content, not only from a readership perspective, but a creation and design perspective is always helpful. If that's the one thing you take away today, I hope it's that. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Elle. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, and listening to you, you know, thinking about um, starting out with, with publishing, I can see how it might be overwhelming. So I really appreciate how you, start, you ended with self-care. And we'll do that actually um, with most presentations because um, as the hour goes on, you might feel your anxiety go up mm -hmm. thinking about all the things. There's so many things. Um, and so, you know, Elle had her key takeaway there at the end, and mine really is, um, if you can just learn to step back um, during mm -hmm. each part of the publishing process and think, this, you know, does this decision impact accessibility or rather how? Mm -hmm. So for example, Elle talked about choosing your publishing platform. You know, that's gonna impact how people access um, the finished product. She talked about formatting and structuring. That's going to impact you know, how screen readers or how people experience that content. Um, and so at each step of the process, you or the author or working together, you're going to be making a series of decisions that will likely have an impact on accessibility, on equity, on inclusion. Um, and so there are trade-offs with most decisions, um, but if you can just sort of try to, try to keep that question in your head, I think it's a good sort of um, guide light. And that is especially true with headers. Um, and so Elle also talked about headers. So, so that the use of headers really informs the structure of, uh, of a textbook or, or another publication. And so thinking about how can the, those be consistently used. So we're starting with accessibility because um, it's actually a really nice setup for all the things that you think about in a publishing program, like a style guide. A style guide will lay out how am I going to use headers consistently in each chapter. So um, take the pressure off a little bit. It's not like you have to kind of commit all of these things to memory. It's just going to become sort of ingrained um, in, the, in the publishing or production cycle uh, with any luck. I will highlight one other thing that Elle said. Um, she said, your author is the expert. And um, the subtext of that is, do you want to be the one making the alt tags? Is that something you think could be better done by the author who's going to be able to understand the context of a cat in an art history textbook when you don't know that much about, um, you know, uh, cats portrayed in oil painting between 17 and 1800? Um, so, it might be something that you decide because you have limited staff that you want to put in your in your MOU that the author will, in addition to you know writing a textbook that uses headers, also you know fills in all of those um, alt tags him or herself or themselves. Or it might be something you train students on. There are so many ways to publish, but these are the kind of questions that start bubbling up. Speaking of questions. Um, there was some conversation in the chat, L, as you were talking there, and one of the questions Katie had was, could we use Totally to evaluate the accessibility or inaccessibility of a press book, for example, or does this work only for web-based books? I think it does work for um, 
some of those platforms. It's basically a bookmarklet that runs in JavaScript. So if your instance allows you to use JavaScript within whatever platform you're using, whether it be Canvas, a website, or any other tool that you're using, then it should be able to really pick up those you know, headers or you know, any of those other callouts and, and um, elements that I, I mentioned. However, that might not be the case for your installation, depending on if you're hosting your own or if you're using a already hosted solution. Um, there are other tools uh, available out there that might uh, work in those instances. You, you can actually um, reach out to me in the class notes and I'll, I'll take your question offline and, and do a little bit more research for you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Katie mm -hmm. and Joshua for those um, questions. And, and um, Katie mentioned Pressbooks, and as many of you know, that's a very popular publishing platform for open textbooks in particular. Um, Elle also mentioned our homework. So um, mm -hmm. if you have any, um, any more questions for Elle uh, that you think might fit kind of that big, big concept, big topic um, that you want to fit in, um, I encourage you to put them in chat. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about um, the homework assignment, which is the um, writing of alt tags, not captions. Um, <laughs> the link in the chat. Um, some of you have already been here um, and started working. So the idea is um, within this Google Doc of an open textbook, you will find three images. If you want to try your hat at describing the images based on what you learned in unit one and listening to L today in terms of wanting to provide context for the content. Um, that's why, a uh, hint, that's why these aren't just three images floating in space. There are three images, you know, within a text. Um, if you want to try your hat at writing some alt tags, um, you'll be able to check out what one another have drafted and L has kindly agreed to give some feedback on, um, on those alt tags that, that she sees there. So that's uh, one of the assignments for this week. Are there any questions about that or any, um, any guidance that you guys might want uh, from Elle while she's here or questions from her presentation? I'm just gonna pause. All text versus long description, asked Julie in the chat. Yeah, that's a interesting, again, a way to think about how much do you want to really develop, you know, your, your content, right? And it really depends on what kind of, again, what the context is, right? What type of content is it, right? So, Thinking about where the long description lives in both your, let's say, um, design document or your textbook. I know that there are some long description fields that say in a old Microsoft version of Microsoft Word that actually goes nowhere. If you put it in there, it's not going to be picked up anywhere. But I think what you really mean to say is the long description that's the maybe the extended version of alt text, right? So what that usually is being used for is things like um, stem fields, right? So if you put the alt text as, if you're pre-generating, let's say a formula, for instance, or a quadratic equation, there are a lot of tools out there that will pre-generate that alt text for you using LaTeX or MathML. And with the combination of other tools like MathAjax, it'll actually say, the formula in MathML, right? It'll call it out and generate that automatically for you. What then you could do in your long description is actually type it out in plain language, right? So you could say the quadratic equation or, you know, actually say what the formula is in whatever language you're using, right? Versus the computer generated um, LaTeX or MathML markdown. I hope that makes sense. 
Well, we're going to continue the conversation. Um, as Elle mentioned, if you have questions, please put them in our class notes. I see there's already a few there. So Yay. please don't, yeah, don't hesitate to clarify. Um, please don't be shy. We're all here to learn and there's a lot of stuff. Um, and that's, again, another reason why um, I think the publishing co-op is a great thing to think about if you want to keep learning and not feel like you've got to figure all this out in the next seven meetings. Before we adjourn, I've just got, I think, two more items. Um, I'm going to share with you a draft document that OpenStax has published about improving representation and diversity in OER materials. Um, again, this is a draft, um, but I think it speaks to some of the other content that was discussed in Unit 1 in terms of considering who you choose to um, represent students and in, in, in student stories that may appear in the text, what case studies are you sharing, you know, is your student reader going to identify with the examples that the author is using in the text. You know, the great thing about OER is it's so customizable. And so if you have a, a faculty author, you know, starting to write a book, really thinking about who, who are the students in, in my context, in my class, can go a long way with helping learners connect with that content. So I'm sharing this with you um, for those of you who are interested. I also wanna say if you have not received an email directly from me about Pub 101, um, please feel free to put your details in the chat and I'll add you to my email list. I will send follow-up emails, um, you know, so later this week I'll send, you know, here's what we did today. Um, here's what to expect next week um, throughout the course of Pub 101. So if you'd like to receive those directly, um, just put your email in the chat for me, please. And I think that's it with two minutes to spare. So um, this was our first Pub 101 session. And um, I'm really excited that you're all here. Thank you for your participation uh, and your good humor. And please join me in thanking Elle for sharing her expertise today and um, in our shared documents. I look forward to seeing all of you next week. And um, until then, best wishes. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Farewell.